All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I'll pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the power of your word, the beauty of your word, uh, the challenge of your word. Um, we want to read your word well. Um, I pray today as we look at the Passover that you help us make connections with the text in a way that will increase our confidence in your word, um, in a way that will challenge us to live uh, our lives in a way that will bring you honor in the world. Um, I pray that you would help us rely on you and you alone uh, for our salvation. And we pray all this, uh, that you would do it for the glory of your name, uh, for it's in Christ's name that we pray. Uh, amen. So what we're going to look at today is the chief event in uh, the life of the nation of Israel. Um, it's the Passover. This is the chief uh, yearly event uh, that's celebrated um, and as always, I'm going to read through. I'm going to try to read through as literally as possible. Uh, and we'll stop uh, on the way uh, and we'll talk about things. So this is what God's word says. And Yahweh said to Moses and to Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month will be for you the head of the months it will be the first month to the months of the year. Now, um, do you know that uh, the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar? Did you know that? So it's a lunar calendar. Um, it's based on the cycles of the uh, full moon. So it takes uh, 29 and a half days to go from full moon to full moon. And so what uh, the Jews did is um, they gave one month 29 days, the next month 30 days, uh, and just alternated. So day one of every month is what's called a new moon, which is a completely black full moon. You have to really look to see them. But... Uh, uh, the new moon is a completely black full moon, and then over a period of 14 days, it will uh, wax until it's the night of the 14th and 15th will be a full moon, and then it will wane from that time until 29 and a half days later. And by alternating 29 and 30 days, you always keep that uh, the same um, there are 354 days if you do it that way, which that's 11 days short of a solar year. So what the Jews did is every 13, uh, sorry, every three years, they had a 13th month and they just did the last month twice, uh, called it second, uh, whatever the name of the month is, and that kept their... Um, calendar in line with the solar calendar. What's going on here is the new year for the Jewish nation used to happen around the autumnal equinox. So in the fall of every year, there's a, a moment where the day is exactly as long as the night is. That's called the autumnal equinox. Um, usually it occurs around uh, September 22nd or 23rd. And what the Jews would do is they would watch for the autumnal equinox. And then the first new moon after the autumnal equinox, that was the start of their year. And so if you know Jewish people, Sometime after September 23rd, they're celebrating what's called Rosh Hashanah, uh, the head of the new year, and that's day one. So whenever the new moon is, is day one, and you're off and running with the Jewish calendar. Now, let me ask you a question. 
Does that seem weird to you? Like lunar calendars are pretty clunky calendars, aren't you? If you have to add a 13th month every three years just to keep it in line with the seasons. Well, verse 2 adds to the clunkiness of that calendar because Moses says, I know, and God is saying to Moses, I know you count your new year somehow associated with the autumnal equinox, but we're going to flip the calendar. Now it's going to be the spring equinox. And the spring equinox is like March 21st, something like that. And then the first new moon after the uh, spring equinox, that's going to be the new year. Is that... The civil it didn't change the feast, but it changed the civil calendar and the sacred. So uh, basically what you have now is the Jewish calendar is divided into two sets of Uh, six months each. Uh, One one is going to be an important day. One ten is an important day. One fifteen through twenty one is an important day. Seven ten is an important day. Seven fifteen to twenty one is an important day. And so What Moses did is saying what used to be the seventh month for you, I want you to make the first month. And so the first month is going to become, so he flipped the calendar. So just be honest. Does that seem a little weird? Like we're, we're already dealing with a pretty clunky calendar adding months and black full moons and new moons. It's like, okay, I'm kind of lost here. But this is what God says. Tell all the congregation of Israel on the 10th day of this month. So it was the 10th day of the seventh month, but we flipped the calendar. So now it's the 10th day of the first month. Uh Every man shall take a lamb according to his father's house. And if the household is too small uh, for a lamb, is too insignificant for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, um, according to what uh, each of you can eat, you shall make account for the lamb. Uh, verse 5, the lamb will be complete. Uh, uh, tamim, uh, same thing the text says of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, perfect in his generation. Same word, the lamb will be complete. A zakar, a male, uh, the son of one year old, it will be for you. It can be from the sheep or it can be from the goats. You can take it. And it will be for a guarding uh, for you until the 14th day of the month, of this month, then they will slaughter it. That is, the whole congregation of Israel will slaughter it between the evenings. And um, do you see you've got a a little footnote there. So, this is what you're to do. Uh, 
How do we know what to look for to start this part of the calendar? What are we looking for? Well, the first thing we're looking for is this uh, spring equinox, right? And the fall equinox. And then we're looking for a black, completely black full moon, right? All of these are completely black full moon on day one. Then we count 10 days. And so we keep it 10, 11, 12, 13, uh, 14. And just, just help me with my math here. How many days would that be? One, two, three, four, five days. And then we, we kill the lamb at this special time called between the evenings. Now, people are going to make all kinds of uh, arguments when that is. Uh, I can tell you with authority that the Jews uh, celebrated between the evenings, sometime between uh, 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, still to this day, if you're uh, wanting to know when the 14th becomes the 15th. Uh, turn your back to the sun, look straight out. When you can see your shadow in your peripheral vision, so mine, my peripheral vision is about right here. So when the sun is about that high, and do you know that this is an hour? Uh, so one for me, one, two, three. So about three o'clock for me in the afternoon. That's when one day shifts into the next day. And, you, and I imagine you say, well, how in the world do you get that? And doesn't Genesis 1 say there was evening and there was morning day one? So a biblical day has an evening uh, before it has a morning. That's the Jewish reasoning. Okay, so let me just ask a question. Is that weird to you? New moons, 10th day. Okay, I'm not quite getting it. If in the flipped calendar, this is the take in the lamb day, do you know what day this is in the uh, corresponding? This is Yom Kippur. Uh, this is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is the Feast of Booze. Uh, this is the day the tabernacle was pitched. Uh, it's also Rosh Hashanah. Um, I wonder what happens here. It's like, okay, I, it's weird. It's weird as all get out, but there may be something to it. So you kill the lamb sometime between 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock um, after you've kept it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 days. Then you shall take some of the blood and uh, put it on the two doorposts. And in Hebrew, the word doorpost is mezuzah. And if you ever have Jewish friends... The, you can tell a Jewish household they have a little uh, copy of the Shema tacked on the doorpost. That's why they call those things mezuzahs. Um, put blood on the two doorposts and on the lintel. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted with fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Uh, do not eat any of it uh, raw or boiled, but roasted with fire um, with its legs and its inner parts. So don't cut it up. Just bake it um, whole. 
Uh, you shall let none of it remain until morning. Um, uh, anything that remains against uh, morning you will burn. Uh, in this manner, uh, eat it uh, with your belt fast and your sandals on your feet. Eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. Why, why do you do this? For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike down the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all the, on all the gods, quote-unquote, of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses um, where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Egypt, uh, this day uh, shall be for you a memorial day. You shall keep it uh, as a feast to the Lord, as a feast of Olam, a feast of forever. You will keep it. Uh, Seven days you eat unleavened bread, so that's 15, 16, 17, uh, 21st. Um, First day, do uh, special things. The last day, do special things. Um, verse 40, make sure you don't break the bones of the Passover lamb. Would you grant that that's kind of weird? What do we do? Very different. In fact, this is the only sacrifice where if you're the head of household, you've got to kill it. The rest of them are all killed by the priest. This is the only one that you as a head of household kill. Let me ask this. Uh, do many of you hope to have children uh, one day? How many of you hope to have children? Okay, uh, tell me what would uh, happen in your house uh, if a uh, head of house came home with a lamb, a little white lamb, fluffy lamb, uh, tail like this, uh, and you kept it inside your house with your little kids. What would, what would that be like? They would, they would walk or they would play with that little lamb. Uh, my, when my kids were little, I can just picture them hugging that little lamb, laying on the couch with that little lamb. Uh, my, probably name the little lamb. You know, put a bandana around its uh, neck. I mean, I can see all those things happening. So, what's it going to be like for me? on the 14th day of Nisan in the afternoon to take that little lamb to my front door and then I have to cut that little lamb's throat. This, help me get a visual picture of that. Like, I'm taking that little lamb outside the front door of my house. I'm standing right there by the door. Where are my little kids going to be? No, fluffy lamb killer, you know. And what's it going to be like next year, you know? And they're going to say, you know, can, can we keep this one? You get another one. But, and when I cut the lamb's throat, what's going to happen right there? I cut, cut its throat. What, what's going to happen? I'm holding it by its neck, and I cut its throat. How's it going to bleed? So I was working construction one time, and I was um, 
pulling a thing off and uh, my arm slipped and went in a nail in the wall and I pulled it out and it hit a, um, what do you call it, an artery? And like, it was like every time my heart would beat, I mean, it was like shooting blood like that far. And like I grabbed uh, my elbow and there's blood everywhere and I'm going, you know, and they had to take me to the hospital and, you know, get it sewed up. Well, that's just a little artery uh, in your arm. We're talking about the major, you know, if you're standing there holding that sheep, as long as that sheep's heart's bleeding, uh, beating, blood is going to shoot everywhere. There's going to be blood all over the ground. Um, that sheep is going to be screeching at its lungs until it loses enough blood to die. Okay, sorry for that gross image, but that would be heart-wrenching. And you got two little four-year-old kids got their noses pressed up against the front door glass watching you do it, right? God says, so you're, would you grant that you would be standing in a pool of blood when that happened? And there's going to be blood all over you, probably going to be blood on the wall. And God says he wants you to take a hyssop branch and to put some of that blood to smear it right here to smear it right here. And every time you walk around, you're going to be walking in blood and to smear it right here. And, and when you put blood on there, it's going to come down and uh, there's going to be blood everywhere. <laughs> so, does that seem weird to you? Like God saying, this is going to be a central thing and don't ever forget to do it because once you do it uh, you go into the house and I see that I'm going to pass over you um, but if you choose not to go into the house you're going to perish and uh, it's probably related to Pharaoh tried to kill all the boys and God is paying Pharaoh back but he's making a provision. There's a way out. Go uh, in the house. Uh, and make sure you use a lunar calendar and make sure you do it between the evenings. That's a pretty weird ceremony. Until you step back and say, is any of it related to the New Testament? So I'm going to just type in something. I'm going to type in the word Passover and hit return. And we're going to go to the New Testament. And it's going to tell us about the day Jesus died on the cross. And this is what it says. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. That verse is telling us what day Jesus died on the cross in terms of a Jewish calendar. What day did Jesus die on the cross? according to the Jewish calendar. And Passover is slaughtered on the 14th day of Nisan. <laughs> Let, let's see.
So John 12, 1 says six days before the Passover. If Passover is the 14th, what would six days before be? 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. Wouldn't it be the ninth of Nisan? It's kind of funny, but you're counting, you've got to count the full day of the 14th. So 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. So John 12, 1 is telling us what happened on the ninth of Nisan. That would have been really great if it were the tenth, right? Because we would, but let's read it anyway. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus had been raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner. Martha served. Mary took pound. Uh, Judas Iscariot uh, said, why wasn't this sold? Uh, he said this not because he cared about the poor, because he was a thief. Uh, Jesus says, leave her alone, the poor you always have. Um, large cl- crowd was there. This is the ninth of Nisan, right? So the chief priest made plans, and then there it is. Oh, my goodness, there it is. The next day. The next day, what day in a Jewish calendar would that be? The 10th of Nisan. And what do you do on the 10th of Nisan? Take the lamb. What happened on the 10th of Nisan? The next day, a large crowd had come to the feast, heard that Jesus, they took palm branches and they welcomed him into Jerusalem. How many days was Jesus safe in Jerusalem? 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th. Crucified in the morning of the 14th, but it took him all day to die. And he died at 3 o'clock. What is precisely happening at 3 o'clock on the 14th day of Nisan? The Passover lambs are being slaughtered. Help me with that. (laughs) Yeah, there's a house that's The provision, if you go in that house, you're safe. You stay outside that house, you're not safe. If you can't afford, find your nearest neighbor. We're all God's nearest neighbor. Now, Exodus claims to be written in 1446 B.C. That's when the book claims to be written. When did Jesus die on the cross? 30 AD, so 1446 plus 30 is like 1476. So using nothing but a lunar calendar, 1500 years before it happened, it looks like somebody was predicting an event. What's the likelihood that that happened by accident? (laughs) 1,500 years before it happened, God is predicting days Have you ever wondered why Easter, like, is it weird times? Have you ever wondered why it's weird? Like, sometimes it's in March, sometimes it's in April. Do you know what the, um, oh, uh, 
There's one more weird thing that happens. So there was this offering called First Fruits. And this is what it says. Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you to and reap its harvest, you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He will wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now, we could read that as any Sabbath, but it's not any Sabbath. It's a Sabbath that follows Passover, which he's outlined here. So, this is a deal. On the day after the Sabbath that follows Passover, bring the first fruits. What day is the Sabbath for a Jew? Saturday. What's the day after the Sabbath for a Jew? Sunday. So Passover, because it's associated with the full moon, the full moon is always the night between the 14th and the 15th. Passover can be any day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. What this is saying is whenever Passover is, you wait till the next Sabbath. So if Passover is on the Tuesday, you wait till the Sabbath, which is Saturday. And then on the next day, you offer the first fruits. First thing that springs up out of the ground, you offer. If it's on Thursday, you wait till Saturday and then the next day, Sunday. If it's on Sunday, you wait till Saturday, you offer it on Sunday. So Passover can do this, but first fruit's always on a Sunday. Anything significant happen? In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of them that slept. <laughs> Do you know what the formula for Easter is? <laughs> it's the first Sunday. It's the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the first new moon, after the spring equinox. That's that's Passover. The other way to say it is that's Easter. The other way to say it is it's the Sunday after Passover. The reason it goes up and down in the calendar is that 13th month. You know, loses 11 days, loses 11 days, loses 11 days, 13th month, loses 11 days, 11 days, 11 days, 13th. That's why it's going back and forth because of the Jewish calendar. So, 1,500 years before it happened, God got the 10th day of Nisan right. God got the 14th day of Nisan right. God got 2.30 in the afternoon right. And God got the day of the week that Jesus arrives from the dead right. 1,500 years before it happened. You know, I went to a state university and uh, studied biblical languages there and I I appreciated in Greek uh, they didn't really have a political agenda they just wanted us to read Greek well it it was really interesting going across campus to the religion uh, department because the religion department uh, was actively trying to prove that the Bible wasn't true every time I walked through the door uh, someone was trying to point out an error in scripture or, or 
something inconsistent. And every time I opened uh, a book in the religion hall, someone was saying the Bible isn't true. But I started reading the Hebrew Bible and I started seeing stuff like this and I can't explain this unless there's a God who knew the end from the beginning and was writing the details of this story in the text of every single page of the Bible. And the more I read the Hebrew Bible, the more I realized whoever is responsible for this, this is a supernatural book. The details of this book. There's a supernatural meta narrative elegance that I just can't explain unless there's a God. Because when you read this, this is just silly, right? This is just like gobbledygook until you ask the question is it connected to Jesus? John 12 doesn't tell you, oh, this is a tenth of Nisan. You've got you've to be wondering what day it was. You've got to have the hunch exactly the way you have the hunch. Does this correspond to something? And then you say, okay, six days, okay, five days. And you even think it's four days because you think 14 and 10. It, but count it, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. That, inclusive counting. That's five. And then you think, oh, Jesus was taken in Jerusalem five days, kept safe. Tenth, eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth. Crucified on the fourteenth and they're trying to get it so that he not die during the feast. And he just happened to die at three o'clock in the afternoon. I don't know. What does that door look like to you with the blood and the blood on the ground and blood dripping down the side and dripping down the top in a pool of blood? What does that look like to you? Stay away, but it look it, it forms a picture. What does it form? And do you remember when Jesus is mocked? And Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us that a man put the sponge on a stick, right? John adds one detail. Do you know what detail he adds? What kind of stick was it? You think about that. There was a guy standing in a pool of blood under the cross with a hyssop branch in his hand at 3 o'clock on the 14th day of Nisan. And people say, if God just gave me more evidence, if God just made it more clear That man was standing in a pool of blood with a hyssop branch, and he didn't get. If we read the parallel text in the Mishnah, I'm not sure if I included that in the homework or not, but in the Mishnah, it tells us how they did everything. And uh, it tells us that when they took their lambs, uh, originally they did it outside their houses, but in Jesus' day, they went to the temple to do it. Uh, it said that they slaughtered, uh, each man slaughtered his lamb, and the priest caught the blood in a bowl. And it says in the wall of the tabernacle, it said there were iron hooks in the wall. And the iron hooks in the wall were to hang the lamb. Probably they're going to hang the lamb upside down to drain the blood out. Iron hooks in the wall. The lamb hanging on iron hooks. Blood going out. 
Mishnah says if you run out of iron hooks, it's no problem. Just get two people and put a board between their shoulders and hang the lamb on the board between the shoulders between two people. Does that look like something else going on on that day? Between two thieves? The blood's draining out? The story of the Passover is a meta narrative foreshadowing of Jesus. That's why Paul uh, can write. Paul can write, cleanse out the old leaven. That's what you do to prepare the Passover. You search out the leaven from your house the day before. That's what Jesus is doing with his disciples during the Lord's Supper. You burn it midday uh, the next day. That's when the sun goes out, right? They're burning their uh, leaven, the sun goes out. Why should you do that? For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Jesus said, any man who commits sin is a slave to sin. You and I, apart from Jesus, are slaves. And we have a Pharaoh who's trying to grind the life out of us. A Pharaoh who's getting rich by having us make bricks without straw. A Pharaoh who is content with our destruction and servitude forever. And that Pharaoh is Satan. Jesus came as the new super Moses. He's delivering us from our slavery. And he did it by becoming our Passover lamb. You and I could not afford the sacrifice to appease God. God provided the Passover. That Passover sprang out of the ground on the day after the Sabbath falling Passover. You and I put that in a basket and wave it before God, and God says everything's okay between us. I'll see the blood. I'll pass over you. The provision is made for everybody. All you've got to do is turn from self-rule to God's rule and go in, go in his provision. What happened in the Old Testament after that? Well, the next day they're free. They're, they're not back in Eden yet, but they're on their way. They're on their way back to the Garden of Eden. They go through a body of water. Do Christians go through a body of water? Does Paul not call that a baptism? All were baptized into Moses? Fifty days after first fruits, the law was given on Mount Sinai. Did anything happen for Christians 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead? Spirit writes the law on our hearts. God came down in fire on Sinai and now God as fire comes down on individual Christians who become little models of uh, God's law in the world. And then we're headed back to a place where eventually we're going to be transformed into the image of Jesus and Jesus perfectly obeyed the law. And if you perfectly obeyed the law, do you get to stay inside the Garden of Eden? If you're, Jesus forgives our sins and, and he transforms us into his own image. The story of the Bible is God's meta narrative um, it's meta narrative elegance. And the whole Bible works that way. And the problem is you and I read it too fast. 
We just read details and we think, blah, 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 blah. You know, let me get to the good stuff, right? Can I get a witness? I mean, I've probably told you this story before, but it may mean more now. But I remember um, when I was a local church pastor, I would take a week and I would study through passages. And I remember um, studying Genesis uh, 6 and I would do it in the Hebrew. I would take a whole week and just immerse myself in the Hebrew of it. And I remember coming to Genesis 8. That was my passage for the week. And chapter 8 is nothing but dates. And I remember on Monday morning, I read through that in Hebrew and I thought, a, a week, really? A whole week? Nothing but dates? It's like, oh my goodness. And I almost skipped over it. But something in me knew better than to do that. And so I started studying, and I started realizing that uh, they go in the ark on 210, which I thought, that's weird. You know, that's like Miss Yom Kippur, they're going in. And it's like, oh, wow, that's like 40 days from, and it's like, oh. And then it rains 40 days, and I thought, oh, there's some kind of symmetry going on here. And so I started plotting all these dates out, and I'd been keeping a uh, uh, sheet for years of other dates, and I'm reading through, and I remember I came to this verse, and in the seventh month, and remember this is a pre-flipped calendar, he flips it in Exodus 12, so this is going to be... In the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark came to rest at Ararat. I was sitting there reading my Hebrew Bible, and sometimes I like to process things out loud. And, and I remember saying out loud, oh, the seventeenth day, and I remember saying it out loud, oh, that's three days after Passover. And I remember saying the sentence. I said, did anything significant in the Bible happen? And that's as far as I got in the sentence. And it hit me. That's the future anniversary of Jesus rising from the dead. And I remember I had to push the Hebrew Bible. I just pushed it there and just stared at it like, it's like, whoa, like, how did that, like, I was going to skip this chapter, and it's like, how did that, and God doesn't talk to me with audible voice, you know, God, I think God talks to us in scripture, but not audible voice, but I'm sure if God had spoken in an audible voice, he would have said, pretty good for a skipper. He would probably say, pretty good for a skipper, right, bud? <laughs> we skip over, and God has hidden these treasures for us to find. But we'll never find it if we come with arrogant eyes. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. This, this whole thing is about Jesus, and the Passover is about Jesus. So, I'll see you on Monday. Uh, there, there won't be any homework for Monday because we're going to do the Red Sea and you've already read through that. So, no homework on Monday, uh, but I'll see you then. Thanks. Thanks.